Hello. <clears throat> Can everyone hear me? Sorry. Uh, is the reverb gone? <laughs> um, okay, now the reverb should be gone. Okay. Let me just uh, tweet out that we're live. <clears throat> Is the microphone OK? Can you hear me well? Okay, good. I'm um I'm in Florida right now. Um let's see. We can just wait a couple minutes um for other people to join and then we can start. I've lived in Florida for um over a decade, but I kind of move in between places a lot. I was born in Lithuania, and then I lived in Norway, and then um, I've lived in Florida a little bit too. Um, I, I know a decent amount of Norwegian. I can mostly understand, you know, whatever people say, but, um, I'm, I'm not ex like, I'm not fluent and I'm not entirely comfortable speaking Norwegian because I have a very thick accent. Cat's name is Spooky. <laughs> I actually have like a Lithuanian Norwegian accent. Like people can tell I'm from Eastern Europe when I speak Norwegian. Yeah, my first language is Lithuanian. <clears throat> my favorite bands, um, my favorite band is Shushu. Um, I also like, um, I used to be really into Coil. Uh, recently, I've been really into Deftones. Um, I like Elliot Smith, The Smiths, um, Machine Girl. No, I'm not a tanky. I, I think in English, um, that English is what I'm most used to speaking. I, I haven't lived in Lithuania since I was 12, so um, I've kind of gotten out of the habit of speaking it. <clears throat> I, 
I have a new book out in Lithuanian would be Ash Shlaido Noya Kniga. Um, the reason I moved to Florida was because my wife is from Florida. Um, I look younger than I am. Uh, I'm 25, but everyone always says I, I look really young. How do you deal with being nervous while talking, presenting in front of people? Um, there's, there's no fix. You just have to go through it. Okay, so I guess I'll start talking about my book. It's called How to Philosophize with the Hammer and Sickle, um, Marx and Nietzsche for the 21st Century. And um, I thought I could talk a bit about the structure of the book and then maybe a bit about how it differs from my videos so people have a better idea of you know, whether they would like it, whether it's for them. <clears throat> so... The first thing that's different about it uh, from my videos is that it doesn't have any of the media analysis that is really common in my videos. There's not much pop culture analysis. Um, I've used this as kind of an opportunity to um, talk about the kind of things that I don't often talk on my YouTube channel simply because it's difficult to apply it to a piece of media or apply it to a piece of pop culture. Um, the media analysis type videos, they work better uh, for a visual medium. So here, you know, at some points I maybe get a bit more abstract. Um, it's, it's, um, it's explicitly and, and very political all the way through, maybe even more than my videos are. <clears throat> and it's um, it's also, you know, sometimes in my videos, I'm just kind of explaining the views of a given philosopher without necessarily taking a side myself. And here I take a very clear side. I take a very clear stance. Um, and it's also also has a much less neutral tone than my videos, because in my videos, even if I um, even if I take a particular political stance and I make that clear, I still present it in a very neutral tone. And here, I kind of write in a more Nietzschean tone, where I you know I make claims in a very bold way. I guess you would say. And then I guess I'll talk a bit about uh, the the structure of the book and, and the exact content it contains. So there's there's an introduction, uh, then there's five chapters, um, and then there's a, a kind of outro. And uh, the first chapter, 
um, is kind of generally just some general remarks on philosophy, on uh, my way of doing philosophy, um, as well as, of course, you know, the uh, approach to philosophy that Nietzsche and Marx have. Um, I talk about, um, you know, the body, the corporeal in philosophy. I discuss the will to truth, um, the relation of philosophy to truth. And then I, uh, I present a characterization of modernity, which is, you know, a central part of this book is that it's a book, you know, it's, it's a modern book. It's a book about modernity. And I, you know, derive from Marx and Nietzsche a kind of particular way of understanding modernity and how to overcome it. Um, um, and then chapter two, it's called the Nietzschean socialism. It basically at first goes into Nietzsche's critique of capitalism, um, just to make clear that although Nietzsche wasn't a socialist, he definitely was not pro-capitalist. And I quote a lot of um, stuff uh, from his works that are very clearly anti-capitalist. And then I go into his criticisms of socialism, and I try to show how the, the reasons for which he criticized socialism do not apply to Marx. Um, so, I, yeah, I try to show how a Marxist, a genuinely Marxist socialism does not succumb to the kind of critiques that Nietzsche very often um, uh, very often presented. And I talk about um, egalitarianism, because that's, of course, um, a very common thing for Nietzscheans to bring up, um, or for readers of Nietzsche to bring up if you're trying to kind of use him for uh, leftist politics, is that he was an anti-egalitarian. And so I restate some of the parts of my uh, my video on why Marx or why Mar or why egalitarianism is unhelpful as a political goal, and I try to show how Marx's politics do not depend on egalitarianism. Um, I go into rights, um, also restating some of the content in, uh, from my uh, the problem with human rights video, um, and I go into the way that Marx and Nietzsche uh, uh, characterized rights, and also the way that they um, criticized uh, rights. And then finally, I go into individualism because it's it's very common to kind of differentiate between Nietzsche and Marx in this oversimplified way of saying Nietzsche was an individualist and Marx was a collectivist. And um, I go a lot into, you know, Marx's statement on individualism um, how he definitely was not an anti-individualist. I go into, you know, how we could understand individualism and then finally how capitalism uh, is not at all conducive to any kind of uh, uh, true individuality. Um, then chapter three is called um, Morality in Aufhebung, or Aufhebung is the correct way of uh, pronouncing it, um, which goes into, you know, Nietzsche's critique of morality and um, explains why Marx, you know, Marxist politics do not depend on a kind of moralist or moralizing um, approach. It's a very common, of course, popular misrepresentation of Marx that he was primarily making a, a moral critique of capitalism. Um, and um, yeah, I go into you know some of the places where Marx critiqued morality, and I, you know, explore you know what Nietzsche meant by morality, and then how it might be overcome. Um, chapter four is the chapter on history. Um, so it goes into both the philosophy of history of Marx and Nietzsche and how they conceptualized history 
and um, you know Nietzsche's idea of historical genealogy. I go into why Marx, or I, I quote some parts where Marx makes clear that he does not have a teleological uh, view of history because that's a common misconception too. And Nietzsche is, you know, often used as kind of the foremost anti-teleological thinker. And uh, he's used in that way sometimes to attack Marxism. And I show how Marx, um, or try to show at least, um, how Marx's view is not a teleological one. And then finally, uh, chapter five is um, kind of a general chapter on affirming life in human emancipation. And it's a, it, it differs a lot from the previous chapters because it's built up of a lot, you know, smaller uh, sections that uh, it, it's kind of like has the rhythm of a, a machine gun, I guess, where it uses the the book so far as as its presupposition and then goes into like a quick exploration of a few particular topics, um, like a critique of the division of labor, um, aesthetics. It goes into the aesthetic views of Marx and Nietzsche. Um, and uh, and yeah, and gener generally sort of the positive ideals uh, that Marx and Nietzsche had, and some of them they shared. Um, and uh, then, yeah, there's like a short outro that uh, tries to, um, you know, tries to connect the entire book so far to to, to real life events and praxis. Um, and, and yeah, that's my book. So I guess now I could just answer a bunch of, uh, questions you guys have. I haven't been paying attention to the, to the chat so far. So, uh, if you have any questions or if you've already asked any questions, please, uh, um, please send them again. So the book, I guess I should have mentioned, the book is already out. It came out on the 9th of November. Um, so it's been out for, I guess, nine days now. And um, it's you can order it from Repeater Books. There's a bunch of other websites you can get it from. There's um, Amazon, uh, Blackwell's, Powell's, Books a Million, you know, your local chain stores might have it. Um, I don't know exactly where, uh, which bookstores, you know, in real life carry it, but I know some of my fans have, have found it in their local bookstore. And then there's also an audio book, which is narrated by me, um, which you can get um, on Audible, um, audiobooks.com. Um, uh, I think Repeater Books also uh, sell the the audiobook. Um, I I'm pretty sure that uh, Blackwell's uh, has uh, has worldwide shipping. Uh, Repeater Books also ship worldwide. I don't know, um, you know. I don't know which uh, which place to order is the best or where where shipping is cheapest, but I know that. Repeater books ship worldwide. I guess I should also mention that this is I guess I, you know, I, I, I don't try to hide it, and I don't want to hide the fact that it's, it's a specifically leftist reading of Nietzsche. I don't try to claim that he was a socialist, but I try to show how he can be used um, by socialists, and in fact, how he has been used by socialists throughout history, and, and so it's kind of like a Marxist reading of Nietzsche. And 
And let me just say from the get-go that although it does have the symbol of a hammer and sickle, it's not a Marxist-Leninist or Stalinist reading of Nietzsche. And I know that uh, a lot of people have uh, really disliked that. A lot of Marxist-Leninists who went into my book uh, were really disappointed that from the get-go it makes clear that I'm not a Marxist-Leninist. Um, I like both Marx and Lenin, but uh, I'm not a Marxist-Leninist. Um, I'm thinking of uh, someone mentioned Lacerdo, who uh, has the book Nietzsche, the Aristocratic Rebel. Um, and unfortunately, I haven't read it yet. Um, I started reading it. And, you know, it's it's an extremely popular book at the moment. And it argues that Nietzsche is a fundamentally uh, reactionary thinker um, for whom anti-socialism is the the unifying theme of all of his works. Um, obviously, I disagree with that view. Um, and uh, I don't think one can make a statement that generalizing and absolute about uh, Nietzsche's works. And I'm thinking that, you know, because it's so popular, it's going to be sort of a big challenge to my kind of reading. So I'm thinking that it, once I finally read it, which might take a while because it's like a thousand pages, um, I might make a written response to it. Um, I don't speak about Foucault in the book. Um, and in general, what people might find surprising is that, you know, usually when one speaks of leftist readings of Nietzsche, one immediately thinks of like post-World War II French philosophy. Um, so like Foucault and Deleuze and Derrida um, and, and, you know, also Bataille a bit earlier. Um, Usually, when current day academics take a uh, take a left wing approach to reading Nietzsche, they're usually inspired by one of those thinkers, and and this book isn't really influenced that much by them, um, at least not explicitly. Um, it's you know those French philosophers, the French post structuralists, um, they were influenced uh, by Marx, but they also either them or their followers tended to criticize Marx for quite a lot of reasons. And, um, and I, and I don't, I try to show that, uh, Marx, um, the, the, a lot of Nietzschean criticisms that have been leveled against Marx, um, do not actually apply to, to his philosophy. When we get back to, um, his original writings and some of the revolutionary movements that he inspired. I should also mention um, that, you know, a lot of people ask me if if they need to already have knowledge of Marx and Nietzsche to read the book. And my hope is that you don't. I've tried to keep it as accessible as I as I keep my videos. I've um, I've tried not to presuppose any kind of expertise um, on the part of the reader. Um, and I and I hope that it, it's sort of accessible to everyone, um, even if maybe some parts, you know, I, I still tried not to dumb it down. And, and some parts uh, might be difficult to people who are not used to reading philosophy, um, but it definitely won't be impenetrable. And um, and of course, obviously, I, I, I still encourage people to read Marx and Nietzsche for themselves because I do have a particular interpretation of them and uh, to confirm or deny it, you, you would have to, you know, do your own reading. And yes, it's also available as an ebook. Um, I'm pretty sure Repeater Books uh, sell the ebook edition. You can also get the um, uh, Kindle edition on Amazon. Um, and also Google Books have it where you can read it 
uh, as an online copy. Um, I'm, I'm not an, uh, I'm not really an anarchist, although, um, uh, you know, I have sympathies with certain forms of anarchism, the, the forms that are close to Marxism. Um, I think that in terms of class struggle, anarchism has been extremely significant in the labor movement. Um, and I am a lot more critical of the state than Marxists, Leninists tend to be, but then I think so was Marx. And um, yeah, but but so when it comes to theory, I ultimately think that a Marxist theory, um, at least the good kind of Marxist theory, is more worthwhile than the anarchist theory that I'm familiar with. How do you feel about people downloading your book for free? Um, I'm neutral towards it because, you know, it's going to happen either way. It's not like I could stop it. And um, I'm just happy about people reading it in general, you know. And I know that um, just as people will download it, whatever I do, some people also buy it, you know, uh, no matter what I do. Um, so I'm not going to be a cop about it and try to take down, uh, you know, <laughs> free, free editions of the book. Um, obviously, we do live under capitalism, so I'm really grateful for the people who do buy it. Helps me pay rent. Um, and also just having a physical copy is just always, you know, better. <clears throat> Nietzsche had a big influence on Trotsky, but also on Hitler. Um, that, you know, I don't know to what extent he actually had an influence on Hitler. Uh, there's no clear evidence that Hitler ever read Nietzsche. Um, although like, you know, everyone at that time, he was obviously familiar uh, with Nietzsche, at least on the surface. It was more um, the, the person who sort of not tried to Nazify Nietzsche was a guy named Alfred uh, Baumler. Uh, I might be mispronouncing that. But he was a kind of um, significant Nazi ideologue, and he tried to present Nietzsche and some of his popular works as a fundamentally uh, fascist figure. And yes, I mean, I talk about a lot of this in my book. Um, Nietzsche's sister had a lot of influence on on him you know becoming sort of notified um when nietzsche died she she took control of uh, his archive and then was able to sort of uh, uh direct his works uh towards the right and tried to make them more appealing to the right um you know the will to power uh was a book that it was basically compiled by her and some other editors uh, from Nietzsche's unpublished notes. Um, and she, you know, uh, she eventually became a member of the Nazi party and she was so close to them that uh, Hitler attended her funeral. So, you know, it makes sense that often when people talk about why Nietzsche became associated with fascism, uh, the story, you know, kind of begins with his sister Um, so, um, regarding why I came to write the book, it was really, um, I didn't plan to at all until, uh, a person emailed me and, uh, and they thought that, you know, I would write a good book and there were someone who was an acquaintance of the people at repeater books. So they asked me if I would like to write one and they said that, um, if I do, that they would, you know, contact repeater books for me and, and suggest it. 
and then uh, and so they did. And Repeater Books got in touch with me and asked me if I'm interested. And it took me about like a year to finally, you know, decide that I'm going to do it. Um, and and I thought that uh, you know because at that time I was. Uh, making a lot of videos on on like postmodernism and post structuralism um i had the idea of writing a book about nietzsche since you know he influenced a lot of those theories and i thought you know nietzsche is such a kind of controversial figure a lot of uh people still associate him with fascism um and there's you know he's very popular so his ideas are often misrepresented and I thought it would be worthwhile to to write a a kind of accessible left wing reading of Nietzsche. Um, and then, as as I was researching it, I, I discovered more and more how um, you know Nietzsche not only has ideas that you know are are useful for the left, but that he has a lot of ideas and a lot of approaches that actually um, have a lot of similarities with Marx. And so over time, as I was writing and researching, I came to center Marx uh, in this book as much as I centered Nietzsche, uh, whereas um, I, I didn't plan to do that at first. Um, I thought I would uh, focus on left-wing readings of, of Nietzsche and socialist readings in general that are not necessarily Marxist and that might even be critical of Marx. But you know, the way it turned out, I. Uh, I thought, you know, this would be the most fruitful ap approach to kind of center Marx in it as well. <clears throat> oh, let's see. Uh, what is my relation to Gregory Marx? So for those who don't know, uh, Gregory Marx is a, you know, a fellow philosopher who um, he has a blog called The Wasted World. Um, and, you know, we, we followed each other on Twitter. We were just generally familiar with each other's uh, works. And, uh, you know, I've enjoyed uh, some of his blog posts. He's enjoyed some of my videos. Um, so, you know, when we were sort of working through releasing the book, I asked him if he would like to write um, a short endorsement for the book. And he did. He was extremely nice about it. Um, he was extremely busy, but found some time for me. Um, so for those who haven't seen it, this is the, the cover of the book. Um, designed by Johnny Bull, who designs most of Repeater Books' works. And as you can see here, uh, the back cover starts with the quote from Gregory Marx, where he says, uh, Cheka achieves the admirable task of showing that there is still more to Nietzsche than the political reactionary or the apolitical philosopher, and that Nietzsche's work stands alongside that of Marx as a call to the great liberation of humanity. Um, the great liberation of humanity um, that I believe is a, is a, is a phrase used by Nietzsche. <clears throat> and uh, since some people might not know the reference, I should make clear that uh, the, the book title is a kind of a pun or a play on uh, the subtitle of The Twilight of the Idols by Nietzsche, um, because the subtitle to that book is How to Philosophize with a Hammer. Um, and so that was just a, a pun I came up with, um, you know, to make clear that it's a, it's a Marxist reading of Nietzsche. Um, some people have been kind of confused either because um, they assume that because of the hammer and sickle that it's a Marxist-Leninist work, or, you know, or they know that I'm not a Marxist-Leninist and they ask why um, I would use it. And 
you know, other than the, the, the pun, the play on Nietzsche's subtitle, I think that, you know, the hammer and sickle symbol was designed uh, at a time when the Russian Revolution and the early Soviet Republic still had a very clear revolutionary potential, um, uh, you know, because it was designed in 1917. So at least in my view, long before, or at least several years before um, the Soviet Union became a counter-revolutionary force. Um, so one person asks if it's an anti or post Hegelian work. And um, it's um, on the one hand, you know, it's critical of Hegel or at least certain readings of Hegel. Uh, but at the same time, I, I try to affirm uh, certain Hegelian, Hegelian aspects of Marx's and Nietzsche's thought, which um, they're often distanced from. So for example, I, I disagree with uh, the Althusserian reading that there was a, you know, a break uh, in Marx's works where the mature work, uh, the mature Marx uh, does not depend on dialectics or a kind of uh, anthropological kind of philosophizing. I disagree with that. And, um, and I also go against the Deleuzian reading of Nietzsche as a fundamentally anti-dialectical thinker, um, which might cause some controversy. Um, because I think there are dialectical aspects to Nietzsche, just as there are like, very important dialectical aspects to Marxist thought. Um, so, yeah. Um, and generally, you know, I'm not a big fan of Althusser. I, I, I haven't read a lot of Althusser, but, uh, but I, uh, I'm very strongly opposed to the idea that, you know, there's a, there's a, sharp break between the young Marx and the mature Marx. Um, I think that there's a, a, you know, a continuity between uh, the young Marx and the mature Marx and a very important one. And rather than being a break, uh, in my view, Marx's mature works are more of a concretization of his early works. And, um, and, you know, it's, the textual evidence is pretty clear on that because uh, some of the, the mature works of Marx contain the kind of dialectical or the kind of Hegelian language and the language of alienation that Althusser attributes, you know, to only Marx's early period. And, you know, there's this uh, joke, uh, I don't remember who made it, but, you know, as more and more texts uh, by Marx kept being published, Althusser, Althusser had to keep claiming that actually, uh, uh, that, that the mature Marx actually started later and later and later to the point where by the end of his career, he ended up claiming that only in the critique of the Gotha program, which is very late in Marx's works, uh, did the break, you know, fully occur. So someone made the joke that Marx is, you know, Marx must have uh, discovered the fountain of youth because uh, because the young Marx keeps uh, taking up a, a larger and larger part of his of his works. Um, Noam Chomsky's critique of postmodernism, um, it's very strange, really. And it's, I mean, it's strange because when he talks about postmodernism, and even when he speaks of Marx's dialectics, he says that he sounds almost anti-intellectual uh, when he does that, because he says that when he was asked about his view on dialectics, he says that he doesn't understand it and that he's suspicious of multisyllabic words, which is such an anti-intellectual position. And it's, you know, 
he kind of has this idea that you know if you if he doesn't understand a work then it must have nothing to it um you know i i think you know i like some of chomsky's you know works on like american imperialism but when it comes to theory you know he's obviously not very well read on it and and doesn't have a very nuanced view or a very nuanced critique of either postmodernism or marxist philosophy <clears throat> um Someone asked about if I would make a video on cultural Marxism, and I might be wrong, but I think Three Arrows, which is a great channel, um, already has one, or at least he discusses it in some video um, where, um, you know, I, I'm pretty sure he talks about how the whole cultural Marxism conspiracy theory has its um origins in nazi propaganda um uh where you know in, in nazi germany they they refer to it as uh cultural bolshevism and it has you know very explicit links to to anti-semitism Um, what do I think about critical race theory? Um, I think that if you take it, you know, if you have a proper understanding of what it is specifically, um, you know, it developed uh, in law studies. And so it's, you know, primarily, it's not a revolutionary philosophy. It's, it's a reformist philosophy that looks at, you know, ways of combating racism, you know, within a bourgeois society. So, you know, I don't think that it's a, it's a Marxist form of philosophy. Uh, it's not a revolutionary form of philosophy. Um, that being said, I, I think the, the whole attempt to ban critical race theory is pretty horrifying. Um, not least because the people who attack it almost never have a specific view of what it is. And so it will, you know, undoubtedly be used to uh, to silence, you know, theories that are critical of racism in general. Um, and you know, uh, because I don't think that most of the people who support the ban could actually, you know, identify the particular aspects of critical race theory, and. Uh, and pro would probably use it to, for example, exclude, um, you know, lessons about American slavery from various uh, curriculums. Um, I actually didn't know that Nietzsche had an influence on, on the Black Panthers. I talk, you know, I, I researched a lot of the reception of, of, uh, of Nietzsche on the left. And, uh, most of what I talk about is the Nietzschean socialists, uh, from the German revolution and then the Russian revolution. Uh, that's kind of where I focus. Um, I actually had no idea that he had an influence on the Black Panthers. Um, if you could link some readings on that, uh, I would definitely look into it. Spinoza, although I haven't read as much Spinoza as I would have liked to, it's undeniable that he had a very clear influence on both Nietzsche and Marx. Um, you know, he's a, he's a thinker who, um, an example of a radical thinker of the early enlightenment. And so, 
you know, he's had an influence on Hegel and Marx and Nietzsche, and I and I think that influence is justified. And um, I know that both Nietzsche and Marx uh, draw very clearly from Spinoza's understanding of what freedom is, um, as he had a kind of um, understanding of freedom which does not depend on a metaphysical view of free will. Um, on Marx's ideas uh, about aesthetics, I actually wrote um, a short article about this recently. You can find it on the Institute for Art and Ideas. Um, it's it's a short article and it's uh, written in much more of a dry style than 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 my book. Um, but if you're interested in the topic, uh, I discuss some of it there. Um, both Marx and Nietzsche actually, uh, in their views on art, were influenced a lot by early Romantic thinkers. So in particular, Schiller, um, who was kind of uh, very rarely read for his philosophy, um, but is actually extremely influential in philosophy and had a kind of ambitious view of art as uh, being freedom in appearance. Um, He's often remembered for, you know, his uh, he was a playwright, so his tragic drama, The Robbers, is quite famous. And then he's also especially famous for um, writing The Ode to Joy, which is, you know, as you know, is used in uh, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Um, the name of the article is, uh, crap, what was it? Um, the, publish, the publishers there came up with the title. Um, um, I think it has the subtitle, How Art Can Save Us. Let me see. Yeah, uh, Marx and Nietzsche, How Art Can Save Us. Um, if, uh, if you look uh, through my uh, Twitter posts or my posts on YouTube, you'll, you'll find a link. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm not self-taught, um, although uh, for this book, most of my research was independent. Um, but I studied uh, philosophy at university. Um, oh, uh, OK. People are asking a lot about Zizek. Um, I have kind of ambivalent feelings about him. Um, there's, you know, parts of him I like and parts of him I don't. I, I think that, you know, he draws on Marx in his uh, in his philosophical works, but I don't think that he really takes Marx seriously when it comes to, you know, explicit politics. I think it's very strange, you know, his political views um, often end up being kind of reformist or, you know, sometimes he says that he wants to return to a bureaucratic kind of socialism, uh, which I don't think is very Marxist of him. Um, and, uh, you know, he's, he's clearly, sometimes he can be very insightful uh, in philosophy. And then at other times, um, he can sort of dance around a question to the point where he never gives a clear answer. Um, or he just, you know, uh, takes on the most contrarian answer sort of for the sake of it. And he can be kind of talented sometimes at uh, speaking a lot without saying much. Uh, I actually uh, um, recently started reading um, a collection of Robespierre's uh, writings, you know, the, the French revolutionary. Um, it's called Virtue and Terror, and has a it has a foreword by Zizek, and it's it's a it's a pretty good foreword, although it does have the kind of typical Zizekian thing, uh, where he kind of 
dances around the topic a lot. And it's true, he's, he's you know, uh, Hegel and Lacan is more important to him uh, than Marx is. I think, you know, I think he did pretty well in his debate with Jordan Peterson, but I was disappointed that he didn't try to popularize more clearly Marx's particular political views um, and, and show the way that Jordan Peterson completely misrepresents them. Um, you know, he kind of used it as a, as an opportunity to talk about his own kind of Hegelian and Lacanian thought and not so much co correcting the, the complete misinformation that Peterson was uh, spreading about, about Marx. So someone asked if uh, if I have thoughts on Lenin, um, and I think Lenin is is pretty important to read, um, and I respect him as a revolutionary, and I don't think that I think the sort of simplified blaming of Lenin for the counter revolution is unjustified. I think if you look into his uh, life and works, it's very clear that he was a genuine Marxist, um, even though, you know, eventually the sort of, uh, uh, the, the, the Soviet bureaucracy, um, grew to a point that he never intended it to grow. And th there was nothing he could really do about it because after all, he was just a single person. Um, but the thing is, I don't, I don't think that Lenin is a Marxist Leninist because Marxism Leninism is specifically the theory that that was developed by Stalin, you know, in the foundations of Marxism Leninism. And Marxism Leninism is neither Marxist nor Leninist, ironically. Um, and, you know, in that work, Stalin goes against not only Marx and Lenin, but even his own past views. I've uh, I've already given an overview overview of my book, and uh, just so people know, I'm gonna leave the stream up after it ends, so people can watch through it uh, later. Um, and yeah, I've I've went to a, a kind of summary of what my book touches on. Um, next, you'll tell us that national socialists were in socialist. I don't know if that's a joke or not. Um, you know, it's, it's like, not only was Hitler extremely clear about the fact that he tried to appropriate socialist aesthetics just because they were popular at the time. Um, but the thing is, there was like, um, a section of the Nazi party that, that was more, you know, explicitly anti-capitalist and they were all purged. Um, it's, it's insane to me that there's still people who think that the, you know, Hitler's self-identified socialism was genuine. Uh, thoughts on pessimist philosophy. That was actually my my sort of introduction to philosophy. Um, my first passion in philosophy was, you know, pessimism. Um, and the first philosopher that I really got into was Schopenhauer. Um, I actually wrote my bachelor's thesis on Schopenhauer. And yeah, I enjoyed Emil Choron, um, Philip Meinlander. I've made a video on him. Um, but over time, I've kind of moved away from that. Um, and more towards a Nietzschean kind of view. Um, and this book is very clearly, you know, 
anti-pessimist in the way that Nietzsche is. Um, Hitler did want to get rid of the stigma against the working class. Well, it doesn't matter if you stigmatize someone or not when you're materially disenfranchising them, right? <laughs> what does destigmatization change if you're explicitly trying to disempower um, that same group of people? I mean, the, the first thing that uh, the, the Nazis did when they came to power was outlaw, you know, socialist and communist parties and, uh, and outlaw trade unions. And, uh, you know, in, in all the people that they jailed, um, there was a very clear bias towards jailing socialists and communists. You know, fascism was basically an attempt to, you know, ameliorate or, or, or reconcile some of the contradictions of capitalism while also crushing the labor movement, right? And, um, it's, and, and so that's why it was supported by large corporations like uh, Coca-Cola and I think General Motors um, funded the Nazi party. Um, because, you know, they, they tried to sort of, uh, crush the socialist movement, um, without, uh, you know, without a revolution. And, uh, you know, it, keeping that in mind, it's no surprise that, uh, Nazism arose at a time when, uh, the the radical socialist movement in Germany was extremely extremely big, and the working class or the ruling class needed to take extreme measures to crush it. <laughs> my Rasputin beard yeah I don't know what Doug Lane was uh, was referring to when he said that because um, for those who didn't know you know uh, Doug Lane who used to be the the publisher of zero books um, once went on the come town podcast and you know, was very critical towards me and said that I have a big Rasputin beard, um, which actually makes me wonder if he was confusing me with Vosh, right? Because I don't know many other like online lefties who have a big beard, but uh, Vosh does, doesn't he? And it's very weird because like I've generally, I generally, you know, liked Doug Lane. And we never had any interactions. So that kind of whole, you know, him going on a public podcast to shit on me was like completely unexpected. I'm uh, uh, a lot of people asking about Vosh. I guess it's inevitable for me to talk about it. Um, I, I don't think Vosh is, uh, you know, nothing against him as a person, but I don't think he's, I don't think his socialism is genuine. Um, and I think his sort of uh, his very strict support of Biden 
has been disastrous, and and we see that now. We see that Biden isn't even uh, fulfilling the 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 very small reformist promises that he had. Um, I think the kind of the the attempt by a lot of socialists to get people to vote for Biden has only kind of uh, you know made the socialist movement seem kind of hypocritical and in the wrong. And I also disagree with his uh, market socialism. Um, I think that what people call market socialism is simply a different version, a different manifestation of of capitalism. Um, and in my view and in Marx's view, uh, markets cannot coexist with socialism. Yeah, like um, the whole kind of co-op socialism, um, which also uh, Richard Wolff, um, you know, is a proponent of. Uh, it's it's not genuinely anti-capitalist because it preserves all of the main, uh, you know, the fundamental mechanisms of capital, of, of wage labor and capital accumulation. And um, it kind of... Uh, uh, a co-op is basically just the working class being its own exploiters in a way. Um, because, you know, even if a given workplace is worker owned, um, the society in general is still under the domination of capital. Um, and, you know, there's a reason that, you know, co-ops can exist in capitalism because they don't actually challenge capitalism. And this is, you know, I'm not going to say that co-ops are not better, you know, so long as we're in capitalism. I'm not going to take a stance on that. And, you know, this is by no means a critique of, uh, of you know, people who try to democratize their workplaces or, or, or people who find themselves being more fulfilled in co-ops, but it's not a it's not a socialist um, form of organization, and we know this because the state doesn't try to you know explicitly suppress it. Because um, when you have genuine you know socialist forms of organization that enact a kind of dual power in society, the state takes a very clear and you know very material stance against it. Whereas uh, when it comes to co-ops. Um, just as it, when it comes to reformist parties, uh, you know, it's a lot more friendly to them. Yep. Worker councils, you know, that's, that is what I think is a genuine form of, uh, workers organizing. Um, so someone asked about, you know, the Russian revolution and the, the kind of, uh, challenges they encountered. And I think this is important to recognize that the Russian counter revolution was kind of inevitable, uh, given the, the conditions of the country at the time. Um, the Bolsheviks were very clear from the beginning that, um, that they didn't think that uh, a Rus Russian transition to socialism would be possible without a revolution in Europe or, you know, in any advanced industrial country. And so they were betting on the success of, of uh, the German revolution, which, you know, was reasonable at the time because the German revolution was, you know, was a powerful force at the time. And, Russia was a country that was not even fully industrialized yet. A large section of the population were still the peasantry. And so the work, the industrial working class were the motor of the revolution. Um, they were a very small section uh, of the population. And, you know, not only that, but 
when the revolution occurred, the the Soviet Republic was then threatened by every major power militarily. Um, and it could not, you know, securely defend itself without a fully developed industry. And, and by the way, you know, during the Civil War, uh, not only did a, a big section of the work, working class, you know, died, uh, but industry was in a very, you know, precarious state. And so the only solution at that point for the Soviet leadership was either to remain unindustrialized and eventually become conquered uh, by outside capital or industrialize Russia themselves. And there was no way to do this without the exploitation of labor. Um, so they were doomed, you know, basically to, to carry out, you know, uh, the, the spread of capitalism. They were, they were forced to enact proletarianization and they were forced to basically carry out the kinds of functions that um, in the West had already been carried out by bourgeois revolutions. And so I hope this makes clear that my uh, my criticism of the Russian Revolution is not that um, is not a moral one, um, nor is it a criticism that oh, so long as they just had a different understanding of socialism, they could have you know established socialism in Russia. No, it's it's a critique based on the material conditions present at the time, and. You know, with the failure of revolution in Germany, um, I don't think there was any way for um, for Russia to transition to socialism at that point. Um, although I do criticize, you know, uh, the kind of move, especially under Stalin, um, away from internationalism uh, towards national state building, and their kind of uh, you know, them ceasing to defend and fund uh, revolution abroad. And then, you know, especially disastrous is their involvement in China at the time, uh, because China had a, a communist party at the time and a lot of, uh, you know, a, a lot of peasants uh, were rising up against, uh, against capitalism and, you know, uh, so the Soviet Union under Stalin basically uh, encouraged the Chinese communists to side with uh, a bourgeois nationalist party, which led to them being disarmed and then massacred. And I don't, you know, it's it's crazy to me that that a lot of Marxist-Leninists completely turn a blind eye to this fact that. That the Stalinist government, you know, had such a direct involvement in crushing a Chinese revolution, uh, you know, early on, and this was, of course, way before Mao, um, and uh, and you know, even more horrifying is, for instance, uh, not more horrifying, but just as horrifying, is the fact that there were certain Russian communists or um, or certain German communists that the Soviet Union. Um, basically gave over to Nazi Germany, where they were then exterminated. Um, and there's, then there's also, for example, a case of um, a worker strike from, uh, I don't remember the exact year, but it was under Stalin. Um, there was a, a sudden decrease in wages and a certain factory went on strike. And often, you know, Marxist-Leninists will say that, uh, oh, well, you know, uprisings like this were orchestrated by, uh, by bourgeois elements or by counter-revolution or by, you know, outside capital. But here you had a working class strike that was literally carrying portraits of Lenin and red flags. Um, so these were people who, you know, who were favorable to Lenin. Um, and and when they went on strike, uh, the the Soviet uh, government opened fire on them, 
and uh, and the crowd included children. Um, so you know, uh, I sympathize with Lenin and the Russian Revolution. I think it was a great revolution, um, but I think the counter revolution, which really uh, you know, really took off under Stalin, um, has been a disaster. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, kind of demoralizing that there's so many online, uh, socialists who try to defend it, who try to defend, uh, Stalin's purges of a lot of the original Bolshevik revolution, revolutionaries. Uh, so many of them were purged under Stalin and, and, you know, not least the ethnic persecution that happened under Stalin. Why were purges in socialist states much more encompassing than in reactionary ones? I don't actually think that they were. Um, I think people just tend to uh, ignore them. As I already mentioned, you know, the Nazi party had a more uh, explicitly anti-capitalist uh, section and, and the kind of more explicitly anti-capitalist section in the Nazi party was purged. Um, and this was the case in, in other reactionary states as well. Um, you know, it happened peacefully when possible, but there were also executions. Um, someone says Stalin took difficult but necessary decisions due to the context. And here's the thing. As I already mentioned, my critique of Stalin is not a moral one. Um, I think the counter-revolution was inevitable. Um, so to an extent, I agree that given the conditions, it was inevitable for the Soviet Union to become, to some extent at least, a reactionary force. Um, you know, like if Lenin had lived longer, I think the Soviet Union would have been slightly better, but it wouldn't have been rescued from counter-revolution because that was a much larger material process that happened there. Um, so I'm not arguing that, you know, certainly there were things that Stalin could have done differently. And certainly there were some, some things that were up to him. But the general outline of, of where the Soviet Union went, you know, was, was caused by the material conditions at the time. And, and also, like, when I speak of Marxist-Leninism, um, you know, I don't deny that, say, the Cuban Revolution, um, uh, I don't deny that the Cuban Revolution was a progressive force. Um, and I don't deny that it's, uh, that it was, you know, that it had a lot of benefit for the Cuban people. Um, I don't deny that the revolution in Vietnam and, and their anti-imperialist struggles were, you know, simply a reactionary force. Um, just as I don't think that bourgeois revolutions in Western Europe were a reactionary force. At the time, they were progressive and they were absolutely necessary in, you know, abolishing feudalism. Um, but in the end, that's what they were. You know, I don't think we should... Just because we support them doesn't mean they were socialist revolutions, right? Uh, they might have been anti-feudal and anti-imperialist in some countries, um, and they might have improved the 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 lives of the people living there. Uh, but they ultimately failed to um, to bring about socialism. You know, it's it's very strange to me when Marxist-Leninists will say things like. Um, oh, well, you know, you have this perfect ideal of what socialism is, but, um, you know, countries like, like the Soviet Union and Vietnam and Cuba, they had no choice but to do what they did. 
you know, and I agree that in a lot of ways they had no choice. But why does that why does that mean we have to regard them as socialist regimes? They're not socialist regimes precisely because they had no choice but to, you know, to compromise on a lot of issues. And uh, he, the Soviet Union was capitalist, in my opinion. Um, early on, it was a revolutionary force. It was a revolutionary anti-capitalist force. But, you know, it never ended up abolishing, you know, capital and wage labor, um, which initially was their goal. And under Stalin, um, they seized, you know, Stalin seized even seeing that as, as his goal. And this is this is part of why, you know, I think it's important to have a kind of some uh, a Nietzschean critique of moralism in the left because a lot of moralism is thrown around on both sides, both you know, both within sections of the left and between different opposing sections of the left. Um, so you know. That's why I want to make clear that my critique of the Soviet Union is not a moralistic one. That, you know, they were morally, you know, they lacked virtue. And that's why um, the Soviet Union became a, a, a capitalist regime. And then on the other hand, you know, uh, Marxist-Leninists will sometimes throw around moralistic arguments against their opponents. Um, and I don't think that actually helps us understand why a revolution becomes a counter-revolution. Um, because uh, moralism is also a very individualizing kind of view. Um, it leads one to argue that, you know, only if this person, this individual person, was different in some way, the counter-revolution could have been avoided. And Marxist-Leninists also do this, you know, sometimes about Khrushchev, or Gorbachev, like, oh, the reason that uh, the Soviet Union started going down south was because Khrushchev denounced Stalin, which I hope people see is a completely unmaterialist uh, kind of view because you're talking entirely about superstructure there. And you have, to, you have to take in the material conditions that were underlying that. Um, or they will say that the Soviet Union broke up because... Uh, you know, because of the individual actions of Gorbachev. And the truth is that it was part of the general, you know, the general movement towards neoliberalism. That was not an individual decision anyone made. It was a global movement. I remind you of Ray William Johnson. Jeez. What do I think about the new atheists? I think actually Nietzsche's works could be very interestingly applied uh, to the new atheists. Um, I think I mentioned them in my book, though I don't go into detail, but the new atheists are kind of an example of how, you know, Nietzsche was very clear that a lot of atheists will denounce Christianity, but in some sense remain in essence Christian, either in their moral views or in their like view towards life. Um, and I think that definitely applies to the new atheists. Um, they criticize religion. Um, but in a way where they reproduce uh, some of the essential, you know, elements of certain kinds of religion. And I think also um, Nietzsche can be used to criticize their approach to opposing religion because they think that religion is mostly about cognitive beliefs and that therefore 
you can kind of uh, oppose it simply by making cognitive arguments against the given beliefs that people have. But obviously that, that that's, you know, the, a, a kind of cognitive argument on the basis of, of some kind of uh, logic uh, is not what leads people to religion. It's not what leads people out of religion. And I think they're ignoring various social conditions that lead to the spread of religion, um, various social functions that it has, and various, you know, general sentiments um, that both, uh, you know, lead people to adopt religion um, and, you know, and sort of stick to it. Um, I think, you know, the, the Marxist understanding of religion is way more nuanced um, because Marx understood that religion arises because of particular conditions in society which make religion or something similar to it necessary or make it um, a kind of, uh, well, as you called it, opium, um, which for him was not a kind of new atheist jab at religion. It wasn't like, oh, religion is just used to, uh, to dupe people. No, it was, you know, at the time, opium was primarily used as a painkiller. And if someone is in pain and they use a painkiller, you don't criticize the painkiller. You criticize the underlying pain that leads a person to, uh, to use the painkiller. And Marx saw it as a kind of a response to the necessary alienation uh, that exists in class society. Um, so I don't think that you can you know, abolish religion simply by arguing against people and making arguments about why their beliefs don't make sense. I think that's completely, uh, it depends on a completely false view um, of, of, you know, of what religion is and how it operates. Um, was Nietzsche a postmodernist? There's no question that he is one of the main influences on postmodernism, if not, if not the main influence. Um, the people that are usually associated with postmodernism, so like Baudrillard, Deleuze, Derrida, Foucault, they all read Nietzsche. They all were clear that they were influenced by Nietzsche. And they all drew from Nietzsche in their theoretical works. So it's kind of funny that, you know, uh, people like Jordan Peterson will sort of uh, proclaim Nietzsche as, you know, one of the greatest philosophers of all time um, and completely miss the fact that his views um, are reproduced in a lot of postmodernist works. Um, and you know, it's, it's not clear if postmodernism as a theoretical development would have even happened if it wasn't for Nietzsche. Um, you know, Nietzsche not only had characterizations of culture that were kind of proto postmodernist, but his views on, you know, philosophy, metaphysics, uh, morals, um, are, are very proto postmodernist and, um, uh, you know, so it's no surprise that he was so important and so widely read uh, by the French postmodernists and then uh, by Richard Rorty in the US, uh, by the Italian postmodernists. Um, yeah, he, he had a very, very clear influence. Yes, I am a socialist. or communist, uh, the way I use socialism and communism uh, is uh, interchangeable, which is also how Marx used it a lot of the time. I think that um, 
often the distinction between socialism and communism is used by, you know, when it's, when it's used by socialists, um, it often can be misleading. And sometimes it is specifically used to justify a kind of reformist or counter-revolutionary politics. Um, I think it's important to identify the fact that whether you're talking about socialism or communism, um, you're talking about a society that does not have wage labor, that does not have capital, uh, you know, because it has abolished the mechanisms of capital. And yeah, you know, like uh, Marx distinguished not between socialism and communism, but between lower face communism and higher face communism, which then later, um, especially under Stalin, came to be called, you know, not lower face communism, but socialism. And Marx was very clear uh, that even lower face communism would already be a, a society without classes, without wage labor, and with, without capital in the critique of the Gotha program. It's just that it would still have um, labor vouchers, which were which would be a kind of currency that does not accumulate like money does, um, but is exchange, exchanged directly for goods and is uh, distributed based on how much labor one has put into society. Um, and, you know, Marxist-Leninists often claim that, uh, that socialism is the transitionary period, uh, when really the transitionary period exists between capitalism and lower phase communism. I uh, talked about this in my video, why Marx was not a statist. Um, which uh, I recommend people to check out because it's a very important correction that's very, very often uh, misunderstood. <clears throat> um, I'll be right back. Just a second.
Hey, can you guys hear me? No, I wasn't. I, I wasn't taking a poop. I promise. I was just talking to my wife. Stop speculating about whether I pooped or not, okay? <clears throat> I haven't played Disco Elysium, but um, I would like to. I'm, I'm definitely interested in it. I'm just like, usually, you know, reading is kind of my job. So when I play video games, I want to relax from that. And Disco Elysium involves so much reading that, I, that I'm afraid that it'll just feel like more work. I've actually recently been playing this game called Atom RPG, which is, it's really cool because it's like, it's like a Fallout clone but set in the form of Soviet Union. And in Atom RPG, uh, like the sequel, Turograd, uh, you can actually um, join like a, a revolutionary group and, and organize a worker's strike. How was religion the opium of the masses if it existed long before capitalism? Well, no one said that it's specifically capitalism. Um, it ex it's, it's because the masses have needed a kind of opium long before capitalism, right? Because um, because the entirety of of uh, of class society has been the history of you know, of, of the suffering of the masses. So Marx never claims that, you know, that religion, uh, that religion is particular to capitalism. Obviously, that would be absurd. He just thought that capitalism would be the final stage um, of class society, after which um, religious belief would no longer be a necessity for people. About Nietzsche's Ubermensch, um, one interesting fact is that uh, Trotsky described the communist man using the Russian word for Ubermensch. Um, I think someone mentioned already in the chat that you know Trotsky read Nietzsche. Um, he wrote a, a short but strange essay on Nietzsche, um, and he sometimes used kind of like Nietzschean language. Um, and he described the communist human being as having a kind of aesthetic quality, the same way that Nietzsche would describe it. Um, and yeah, as being like an ubermensch. Um, if I remember correctly, he says that under under communism, um, you know, a regular human being um, will reach the heights of an Aristotle.
Um, so someone mentioned that religion is older even than, than class society. Um, so the Marxist explanation of that would be that even before class society, um, people still had to deal with natural scarcity. Um, and that required a kind of opium. Um, what's special about capitalism is that it is the, the stage of society at which scarcity is abolished um, to the point where there's overproduction. And when that overproduction is taken control of by the conscious and organized working class and turned into, into you know, social property, um, life can be sort of directed according to, uh, for the first time, life can be directed, you know, uh, by human needs and human ends. And yes, Marxism absolutely is relevant today. And that's partly why I wrote this book. Um, you know, what a lot of people don't recognize is that even though capitalism has underwent a lot of different specific manifestations, you know, we've had the early competitive capitalism. Um, we've had the, you know, imperialistic capitalism and the kind of uh, state-centered capitalism of the mid 20th century. And then we've had, we have neoliberal capitalism, but throughout all of those changes, Marx's analysis of capitalism's most basic mechanisms and functions is still valid, right? Because he, he sort of went to the bottom of capitalism, not to its particular manifestations, but to its, you know, necessary mechanisms, the, you know, like capital accumulation um, and wage labor. Um, so someone asked about my Studio Ghibli um, video slash, you know, it's, I, I, uh, uh, I think it was last year or maybe even the year before that I, um, I made it, I made a video where I used Heidegger, um, Heidegger's writings to explore the movies of, uh, of Miyazaki, um, and also Studio Ghibli more general, more generally. And uh, Studio Ghibli have extremely strict uh, copyright rules. So um, it got taken down and I've, I've tried all, you know, editing it and various filters and it never worked. So I wasn't able to upload it on YouTube. So I uploaded it on um, uh, my Google Drive, which I'll link in the chat in just a second. I don't know why my uh, browser is being really slow right now. Okay, just a second. Okay, finally. 
here's the link uh, where you can find uh, my video on on Heidegger and Miyazaki. Um, just be aware that uh, sometimes it gets overloaded if a lot of people visit it at the same time. Um, so it's possible that it might take a while before you're able to see it or download it. Um, have I seen the video by Liv Agar about Nietzsche? Yeah, it's a great video. Um, and actually, I sent her a copy of, uh, of my book, and uh, she said that she would talk about it or review it on stream, which I'm looking forward to. Um, in case people don't know, um, um, the Lit Crit guy, um, who has a YouTube channel, and some of you might know him from the uh, Horror Vanguard podcast. Uh, he wrote a kind of response to the book on his, uh, which you can find on his Patreon page. Um, it's a great response where he connects uh, connects my writing with the philosophy of Ernst Bloch, and um, um, and also Logan O'Hara. Some might. Some of you might know him as Rad Sheba, um, has uh, written also a kind of response to my book um, on uh, on morality, which you can find him on the you can find the article on the anti capitalist resistance website. I also have been told uh, that a, uh, a review by Jacobin has actually been uh, commissioned. Um, I'm not 100% certain if that will happen yet, but that would be interesting to see. Um, if any of you are familiar with them, um, the podcast PillPod invited me on. Um, so at some point, I'm probably going to go on there. And then I've also been invited on by the Horror Vanguard, but, uh, you know, that podcast is about horror movies, and, and I'm not sure uh, what I could say about that. Popular in Turkey. Why is that? Um, someone asked me to read a passage uh, from my book. Is there a particular, uh, you know, topic or chapter you're interested in in hearing?
How do you write a book? Honestly, I still don't know how. I, I think people will be able to see how kind of disorganized this book is because I had no idea how to how to plan writing a book. I had no idea how to do it. And uh, I kind of just went with my instincts. I actually like did the opposite of planning the structure. I, I wrote in a completely disorganized way. And then when I had, uh, you know, enough material for an, an entire book, then I try to sort of group it according to topic and make it, you know, have a semblance of structure. And just, you know, for people to know, um, this is the, the, the thickness of the book. Um, it has around 250 pages, uh, not counting the, the end notes. Okay, let's see, chapter two. I'll just read the first paragraph of chapter two. Every, everyone knows that Nietzsche was an anti-socialist, but that by no means entails that he was a supporter of capitalism. In fact, we can find in Nietzsche, however underdeveloped, a critique of capitalism. Modern life, as he saw it, was primarily divided between the toilsome and unfulfilling lives of wage workers, the meaninglessly calculated lives of businessmen and property owners, and the inhuman and hypocritical lives of state bureaucrats and politicians. All of these modes of existence for Nietzsche were equally contemptible, and he was unable to discover in any of them the potential for a future society. The reason he was able to take such a critical distance from bourgeois life why he was able to attack it so incisively despite not being a socialist was because he was exempt from the defining types operating in modernity. Due to his illness, he was able to leave behind the academic life early on, which to him was as dry as the commercial life and as cold as the political. The pension disbursed by his university allowed him to live out the rest of his life while having to engage in neither wage labor nor commerce. This position gave Nietzsche a particular advantage, that solitary distance that he needed for a total critique of modernity. But this was also one of his main disadvantages, as a lack of grounding in bourgeois society meant that his means for superseding this society also lacked substantial grounding. This is why it is mostly his earlier works, prior to his self-isolation, that address the productive relations of bourgeois society most explicitly. The reason Nietzsche posited an aristocracy as his future ideal was because the aristocracy is a pre-modern phenomenon and therefore, like Nietzsche himself, exempt from both labor and commerce. 
the aristocracy was Nietzsche's way of positing a socio-political element beyond capitalism. <clears throat> Nietzsche didn't know how to make risotto. Yeah, he learned, uh, he learned how to cook it in Italy. I think uh, his... Uh, the 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 person that he was renting uh his place from taught him how to do it Is it true that he only drank water and sometimes milk? Um, it's mostly true for his, you know, later life. Um, he used to drink alcohol like earlier in life. Uh, he once got uh, in trouble as a student because he got extremely drunk and was causing trouble, um, and it almost led him to be to being expelled from school. Um, and partly for that reason, you know, he was also very ashamed because of his mom's reaction. And partly because of that, he uh, ended up later being very critical of alcohol consumption. Um, he did do a lot of drugs, though. He did opium and, and psychedelics. Um, Marx, on the other hand, probably the biggest difference uh, between the views of Marx and the views of Nietzsche was that uh, Marx was a heavy drinker of beer. Uh, he drank a, a ton of beer, um, whereas Nietzsche was quite critical of beer and, uh, um, and even said that the reason German philosophy is bad is because Germans are all beer drinkers and that sort of uh, clouds their minds. Okay, here's another section uh, I'm going to read. Uh, this is about um, art in, uh, in the Russian Revolution or the early Soviet Republic. Lunacharsky, the Nietzschean Bolshevik, proclaimed at the first Soviet conference of the departments of art that, quote, the proletariat must finally eradicate the sharp difference between life and art which has concerned the ruling class of the past, end quote. And fellow Nietzsche and Volsky saw in socialism a world where creativity permeates the prose and poetry of life. Trotsky, in Literature and Revolution, described, even using the Russian word for Ubermensch, the human being of the future aesthetically, quote, more harmonized, more rhythmic, more musical, end quote. Are social processes given beautiful form by the arts and quote all the vital elements of contemporary art developed to the highest point end quote alexander rodchenko the soviet artist famous for the 
for his iconic constructivist works, declared that it is, quote, time for art to be an organic part of life. And he listed the following slogans. The future is not going to build monas monasteries for priests or for the prophets and clowns of art. Down with art as a showy gem in the dark, grimy lives of the poor. Down with art as means of escape for a, from a senseless life. The art of our age is conscious, organized life, capable of seeing and creating. The artist of our age is the man able to organize his life, his work, and himself. One has to work for life. One has to work for life, not for the palaces, churches, cemeteries, and museums, end quote. Um, so that section was about, it's from the section on aesthetics, um, and it shows how it was a, a common idea in the Russian Revolution that the division between art and life would be abolished. Should I consider opioid consumption to enrich my philosophical output? Uh, I wouldn't recommend it, though maybe Nietzsche would. Um, there's actually a letter that he sent um, to his former best friend, Paul Ree, and his former crush, Lou Salome, um, after their you know friendships ended. Um, in this one letter, he writes that he just took an extremely large dose of opium, uh, but it actually made it made him uh, see things way more clearly. Is there any Nietzschean or Marxist critique that has been made about analytic philosophy? Um, I, I do criticize analytic philosophy in this book. Um, I think in Nietzsche, it's, you know, the most clear. Um, his critiques of philosophy as the will to truth or a kind of philosophy without any passion is definitely applicable to a lot of analytic philosophy, um, though not all of it. And, you know, in recent times, of course, there's been a lot of uh, a Nietzsche scholarship in analytic philosophy. And, uh, you know, a lot of analytic philosophy could be criticized from a Marxist perspective as not, uh, you know, as not having any kind of... Uh, explicit social grounding um, and as lacking a historical approach. Um, again, not all analytic philosophy, but there's a lot of analytic philosophy that uh, sees philosophical problems in a, a historical manner. Um, you know, this idea that there's sort of uh, perennial philosophical problems that can be understood outside of social and historical factors. Um, Marx and Nietzsche as well would, you know, uh, very strongly criticize that kind of approach. <clears throat> what did Nietzsche mean by nihilism being a transitory stage slash period? Um, so, Nietzsche didn't believe that nihilism could, could last for a very long time since, simply because, at least in its developed form, nihilism is the absence of values. And human beings, you know, need some form of values to be able to live. Um, and so he believed that so long as nihilistic conditions prevail in society, they will eventually either be overcome 
or it will lead basically to the self-destruction of mankind. And he even saw, you know, the pessimistic philosophies of his day as being a symptom of nihilism, uh, where people were getting more and more wary of life. Um, it's kind of like similar to, you know, how Marx viewed capitalism, that it would either lead to a higher stage of society or it would, you know, destroy us. Um, and yeah, regarding Buddhism, um, I can't speak too much about Buddhism itself because, you know, I haven't, uh, read much about it. Um, and, you know, my familiarity with Buddhism comes mostly from Schopenhauer. Um, and he's often criticized, uh, as misrepresenting Buddhism, um, which is understandable because, Schopenhauer was writing at a time when uh, the first uh, translations of Buddhist works were appearing in Germany. And, you know, often the earliest translations uh, can, you know, can be uh, misleading in some ways. Um, and Nietzsche also took his view of Buddhism from Schopenhauer. So they both understood Buddhism to be a life-denying, life-negating philosophy uh, is just that uh, Schopenhauer believed this was a good thing and that therefore we should be more like Buddhists. Um, and Nietzsche saw this as a bad thing because he wanted to affirm life. And so he criticized Buddhism uh, and he sometimes, uh, you know, said that a, a form of Buddhism is basically spreading uh, through Europe. Why is egalitarianism not a good political goal? I have a video on this. Um, it would be wrong to say it's not a good political goal. It's just that it's an, either an incoherent political goal or one without any content. Because there's no such thing as equality as such. There's no you know, absolute equality that we can simply move towards because equality is always equality of some particular characteristic so you could talk about equality of wages or equality of political representation or equality of this or that but um, it's always going to be equality in some particular respect that will also then inversely decrease equality in some other respect so the example marx gives is if we increase the equality of how much uh, a given person earns per product produced, we will decrease the equality of uh, how much a person produces per hour, for instance. Um, and there's no decontextualized way in which we can understand um, equality as such. Um, and, you know, the particular respect in which we need to increase equality will always depend on concrete and particular circumstances. So I don't think it's helpful politically to talk about equality as such. Um, and I have a section on this in, in the book as well. Um, and, yeah, someone asked for a... I'll link to the to the Miyazaki video again. Here it is. Um, and also, I I could mention that you know when uh, the German um, the German Socialist Party in their program demanded abolition of all social and political inequality, 
uh, Mark said that that's a kind of vague and unhelpful goal um, that would be better replaced by the abolition of class distinctions. Uh, Engels also has a quote in a letter um, uh, where he says that it's kind of an old, uh, you know, bourgeois concept that is no longer useful for socialists. Yeah, there's a torrent floating around of the Miyazaki video, which, uh, which I'm completely fine with. I hope people spread it as much as possible. Been over two hours, so I'm gonna be leaving soon. Um, oh, hey, my cat is here. Hey, come here. She came to say bye. Here, uh, maybe you can hear her purring. <laughs> That's my biggest fan. Her name's Spooky. Bye. <clears throat> Why are socialists mostly cat people? Um, so this, uh, this is actually my wife's cat, of course, but, uh, uh, yeah, it's because of her that we have a cat. Um, I used to be more of a dog person. I had a dog growing up, so I might do more streams if people like them, maybe we'll see. No children, no. <laughs> I'm hoping that uh, I, um, I can put out a new video this month. I'm mostly done with the script. Uh, it just needs an ending. Uh, it's actually a video that uh, I got the idea for because I was playing a, a Doom mod uh, where you have to kill Margaret Thatcher. Um, and that gave me the idea of doing, you know, a video on Thatcher and neoliberal neoliberalism more generally. It can definitely be characterized quite concretely. It's uh, 
you know, a variation of capitalism that began in the late 70s and the 80s um, with um, mass privatization, the decline of uh, the welfare state, benefits, um, uh, the decline of uh, trade union power, um, and was exemplified in figures like Margaret Thatcher, uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, Deng in China, Pinochet in Chile, um, and has basically spread around the globe. Okay, I guess it's time for me to go. Um, but if, if people ask for it enough, I might do uh, another stream sometime. Um, also, in case people uh, didn't hear about this tomorrow, I'm doing uh, an AMA on uh, the late stage capitalism subreddit. Uh, it's going to be starting uh, at 1 p.m. Easter time. So uh, I hope I'll see you there, and uh, I hope you uh, enjoy my book and enjoy the rest of the day. Bye-bye.